All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to the exciting new webinar series, Dementia Talks Canada, presented by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada in partnership with Brain Canada. Uh, my name is Leah Sandals. I'm going to be moderating this talk. I'm a person who works with the Alzheimer's Society in uh, knowledge translation and editing, and I have um, my mother and aunts had frontotemporal dementia at an early age, so that's part of why I'm moderating this panel. I just want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge that the land that the Alzheimer's Society of Canada offices are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And we also acknowledge that our offices are located on territory covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, you'll see a poll pop up um, at this time if you wish to fill it out. Also, just say in relation to the land acknowledgement that another uh, wonderful organization here based in Toronto is the Native Women's Association of Canada. And they have been producing and releasing some fantastic culturally appropriate uh, resources about uh, caring for a loved one with dementia, about a uh, dementia stigma toolkit and a dementia storybook. So I strongly encourage anybody who's interested in resources and tools in the dementia space to check out the Native Women's Association of Canada website now or after this talk. Uh, now, I would like to just tell you a little bit more about this series before we get started officially. Um, the purpose of Dementia Talks Canada is to provide the most up-to-date and relevant dementia research and topics to people who are affected by dementia in Canada in ways that are practical and can be applied to their everyday lives. The Alzheimer's Society is partnering with Brain Canada on this exciting new talk series. As you already know, the Alzheimer's Society is Canada's leading nationwide health charity for people with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Uh, active in communities across Canada, the Society provides information, programs, and services to those living with the diagnosis and their caregivers. And the Alzheimer's Society Research Program is Canada's leading funder to, of research to better understand the causes of dementia, improving treatment and care, and towards finding cures. Brain Canada also plays a unique and invaluable role as a national convener of the community of those who support and advance brain research. A greater understanding of how the brain works will contribute to the prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and cure of disorders of the brain, thereby improving the health outcomes of Canadians. Brain Canada's main areas of focus are fundraising, granting, and strengthening the brain research community. So today's discussion is again the first event in the Dementia Talks Canada series. Uh, each month, our series will feature a conversation on one topic related to dementia involving people who have direct firsthand experience. And today for our first talk, uh, Growing the Conversation on Young Onset Dementia, we have four individuals with us who possess unique perspectives and knowledge regarding young onset dementia, which is a term we use uh, when dementia is, symptoms emerge in a person before the age of 65. So dementia in people in their 40s, 50s, and early 60s, or even uh, sometimes their 30s and 20s. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Uh, Mario Gregorio is a student mentor with UBC and Simon Fraser University, in addition to a variety of other groups. Uh, wonderful to have you here today, Mario. I know that you first experienced dementia symptoms in your 50s, um, so I appreciate your input today. Uh, Natasha Jacobs is the advisory group lead here at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, and she has been sharing a lot of great uh, stories and experiences for our new Young Onset Dementia Hub around her family's experiences uh, with Young Onset Dementia. Uh, next, we have Dr. Mario Maselis, who is a neurologist at Sunnybrook Research Institute. Um, and among his many accomplishments, he authored a report for last year's World Alzheimer's Report about how can we diagnose Young Onset Dementia more efficiently, which is really important because usually, as many people here know, it takes unfortunately quite long for people with young onset to be diagnosed. And last but not least, we have Cameron Berry, who is a knowledge translation associate here at Alzheimer's Society of Canada. 
and is also a researcher and scholar around another really important facet of being onset dementia, which is young caregivers. That is to say, caregivers who are aged 15 to 29, sometimes younger, sometimes a bit older, um, but who can play quite a significant role in caring for folks and family members with young onset dementia. So a big thanks to each of our panelists for their involvement in today's talk. Um, we thought we would get started soon after a quick explanation that the session is being recorded, um, but it's only video and audio of each of the moderator and the panelists that are being captured during the meeting. We will have a Q&A session near the end of this presentation. So if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat box uh, when the discussion wraps. And we also have a skilled team monitoring the chat box for any technical issues as well. So if you have any during this presentation, please let them know and they will help you out. So um, wanted to get started with Maria Gregorio. It's, we know you do so much work uh, educating people at universities and community settings and us here at the Alzheimer's Society too about experiencing dementia in real life. Um, we, are, we know you have a video already prepared actually so that you don't have to repeat the same information every time you give a talk. Is it okay with you if we start with that video? Yes, please. Uh, I'm glad to be here, I have to say that. Okay. Thanks, Mario. All right, so tech team, if you can get the video um, going and then after the video, we'll continue the conversation. My name is Mario. I came to Canada in 1974 when I was uh, 27 years old. I left everything I own in the Philippines, and this is just like a new beginning. I retired from Talas after 27 years, and a year later, I was diagnosed with vascular dementia and possibly Alzheimer's. This was the beginning of a new journey. This is the new reality for me. Everything that I hope to accomplish or thought I would be doing after I retire had to be re-evaluated. I learned as much as I can on how to deal with my condition, read a lot of books, attended seminars. I wanted to understand and learn things I can do to cope with my illness. I decided to take control and take charge of my health, research the topic of chronic inflammation illnesses and uh, radically reduced my consumption of animal-based food like cheese, dairy, eggs, milk, and meat. Junk food, colas, and anything loaded with sugar, starch, or oil were thrown out the door. I loaded on vegetables, fruits, and beans, and anything that is supposed to be good for me. And smoothies became my best friend. I made a point of eating out with friends or family members once a week. I always pay because I believe this is cheaper than seeing a therapist. We have fun trying out different ethnic restaurants and our mission is to find places where we can eat cheap but good. In Vancouver, the multi-ethnicity of the city makes this a very easy thing to do. I bought a digital camera and used it to create destinations for my morning walks. And I joined Photographers 101, a website managed by Barry Petska. This hobby, more than anything else, have made life bearable for a person like me who have dementia. Vancouver is a fun city to take pictures. Everything changes after a few weeks. Birds and flowers in the spring, trees and street festivals in summer, the falling leaves in autumn, and snow-capped mountains in winter. I keep busy with my volunteer work. The Vancouver Sun Run, Bank of Montreal Run, the Nova Scotia Run, and the Climb for Alzheimer's. On Thursdays, I help seniors in their once a week walk at some of the safe and interesting parks in Vancouver. Being a mentor for students has become my passion. Giving them an insight on people with disabilities, I believe, make them more sensitive and compassionate in their chosen profession. 
the Alzheimer's Society invited me to join the leadership group Help Create Policies and Programs for Persons with Alzheimer's and their caregivers and their family members. Five years ago, I joined to resume Vancouver as a visitor experience specialist volunteer. I am surprisingly good at this because I was nominated twice for their service awards last year. On my last visit to my family doctor, he said that my weight went down from 164 pounds to 148 pounds. My A1C diabetes score went down from 7.1 to 5.6 and my memory score is very encouraging. It is now seven years since I was diagnosed. I'm doing well. I like to think that I am getting better. This is an incorrect assessment because we all know there is no cure for Alzheimer's or dementia, but it is possible to prevent the progression. This gives me hope that it is going to be a while before I really get to the stage where I am not able to look after myself. I focus on my abilities to do things instead of my inability to cope with everyday activities. There really is no point in dwelling on missed opportunities. This is the new me and I have to live with it. I now have my quiet moments and just be at peace with myself. I joined a group of seniors at the Roundhouse Community Center Du Tai Chi. I do not remember the moves, but with my friends, it is easier. And when we make mistakes, we just laugh. It is always fun to chat with them and talk about their grandchildren, their favorite food, their secret recipes. Having dementia is like a journey. I do not know when it will end or how it will end. Like the movie called Life is Beautiful. I intend to make the most of my remaining days doing things I enjoy. I love talking to people. So I will be with them. I love taking pictures, so I will continue with my morning walks with my camera, admiring the flowers and the trees and the birds around me. Yes, it is a long journey. I think of my brain cells like the twinkling stars. They are beautiful and bright. As my dementia progresses, there will be less and less of them but I will still be here doing my best, contributing to my community, playing an active role with my family. Best of all, enjoy myself. Mario for being willing to share that video with our audience here today um, and with so many others. Um, just before we say hello to somebody else, can you also give us an update on um, the how long you've been living with dementia now? When, it, when that video was made, it was seven years, I think. So 
It's been, uh, I was diagnosed with a vascular cognitive impairment uh, in 2008. So it's been 13 years. Uh, and and uh, one of the things that I really like and laugh about uh, uh, this uh, uh, today is uh, when I was diagnosed, the doctor told me seven to 12 years. And here I am uh, 13 years later, I like to think I'm still going strong. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Um, I think so too. Uh, and actually now, um, maybe I'll just ask, since we're talking a bit about doctors and you mentioned kind of what the original prediction was that you received from your doctor. Um, I'm wondering if we can talk to Dr. Mario Maselli's a bit. Um, Dr. Maselli's, uh, I just wanted to know first, so um, how did you become interested in young onset dementia research and diagnosis? So first of all, thanks, Leah, and, and the Alzheimer's Society for hosting this uh, this great forum, and 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 thank and I'm happy to be here talking to you uh, about this. Um, I've always been um, interested um, in in dementia in general, uh, but uh, in particular young onset dementia because of some of the challenges um, that patients and their families go through. Uh, along the journey, um, often um, the the diagnosis uh, takes a very very long time to make, uh, as you alluded to earlier uh, when you started this conversation, um, and the diagnosis takes a long time to make, often because it's not typical that we see people in their 30s or 40s or 50s with significant cognitive symptoms, and it's thought to be a disease uh, of, of of aging. So, you know, typically after the age of 65, and usually when people are in their 70s or 80s even, um, and, and, and in, in that generation, it, in, in that age group, um, even though we shouldn't accept it as being normal, uh, it tends to be normalized because, you know, people will minimize and just say that, you know, you're, they're just getting older and that's just aging effects, even though that is not normal. And anyone experiencing cognitive symptoms at any age should, should seek proper medical care. But one of the reasons why is, is that, you know, sometimes I would see patients who have, you know, been seen by many different doctors, uh, um, different backgrounds and, and, and families get very, very, you know, uh, frustrated, patients get frustrated with the long diagnostic process. And, and that's mainly because, like I said before, it's not typical to get symptoms under the age of 65. So, so you know, I, I, I became interested in this, in this area of, of, of neurology uh, because I wanted to, to try to, you know, uh, you know, set the bar higher for making the diagnosis earlier for investigating it very thoroughly and comprehensively so that we can offer whatever we have to offer to patients uh, who patients and their families who are suffering from it. Um, so the other component that that kind of really drew me into this area of, of clinical medicine and research um, is is this is the fact that you know, people are experiencing this at the prime of their lives when they still have careers, uh, they still have families, they potentially have young children still, depending on what age they develop symptoms and what age they had ch uh, children at. Uh, and so the, the, the psychosocial impact is, is, is huge for all types of dementia, but in particular for young onset dementia for all of these reasons. So this is why I became interested in researching it uh, more and another reason why I became more interested in, re in in research related to this is because I have a background in genetics. And when you have younger onset cases of dementia, you're more likely to be able to identify certain particular types of genes that can cause the dementia syndrome. Uh, and so uh, that gives us, uh, you know, a, a better way of actually confirming the diagnosis. So for these reasons, that's why I, I, I've, you know, became interested in this early on in my career, and study it, um, and 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 try and trying to understand things more. And and a little bit later, I can talk about some some research I'm doing. So, great. Oh, thanks, Dr. Maselis. Um, and uh, maybe I'll pass it over now to um, Natasha. Uh, Natasha brings so much. Uh, 
experience around um, both personally and professionally around what people's different dementia journeys can look like through care systems and institutions. And um, do, are you open to speaking a bit about like your family's experience, Natasha, and also kind of the need to expand some of those models that that are in the medical and care systems? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm, my name is Natasha Jacobs. I am the advisory group lead here at the Alzheimer's Society, um, but also my family experienced young onset dementia through my grandfather um, who experienced symptoms um, quite early, was formally I would say he wasn't even really formally diagnosed at any point, but at, at, at some point um, when we really noticed his symptoms getting a, a lot worse and we somehow reached out for care, it was more around the age of 65 um, that we were sort of in some of those final stages, unfortunately, of his dementia where we, we were, what I say, ready to admit that he had um, dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, and, and some of what led me to join um, into this dementia space or to study it in, in, in school was that uh, my family was in denial of his diagnosis, that um, my community as a whole wouldn't recognize that dementia really existed. Um, that within um, Caribbean spaces and within um, spaces of people of col color, we didn't recognize ourselves in the, the typical dementia journey. Um, what that to me means is uh, you recognize symptoms, you go see your doctor, you sort of get into that um, typical um, sort of journey of finding your way into long-term care eventually. Um, and that wasn't our journey. Our journey looked very different. It was a uh, multi-generational households. It was aunts and uncles looking after each other. And it was really um, not much education around what dementia was as a whole. Um, my grandfather's symptoms, my grandmother who was looking after him primarily would often just diminish some of his um, symptoms. She often said he was just tired. Oh, he's just confused. Um, you know, leave grandpa alone. Don't talk to him. Um, and at most points, he was very isolated from us because if he was to speak up or really show his symptoms, there would be there would have to be an admission. Um, and it really trickled down into even my father and his children. Um, they covered for him a lot. Um, they would drive him places because they were afraid of his driving, but they would never say that. They would just say, oh, let me take you, dad, or let me give you a lift and those sort of things. And at the time I was about 11 or 12, but I could still see that something was really wrong and nobody really wanted to talk about it. Nobody really brought it up. Um, it came to a point at one point where he was we were all standing at the doorway saying our eight millionth goodbye as some families do. And he turned to me um, and said, hey, you in the red shirt, come and give me a hug. And I was fed up with the whole family started like, you know, covering for this guy. And here he is my grandfather and he doesn't know my name. And I know that no one's admitting that he doesn't know my name. And I sort of point blank looked at him and said, what's my name? And you know, he just sort of said, you, hey, you in the red shirt. And I just said to him, what's my name? And there was a silence that was deafening. And it was a turning point in our family. And I remember my mom just saying, I know that this is your trajectory, because at that point in your life, you knew that we needed to talk about it. And then that's sort of what led me down this road was to make sure that families who have even a different journey, who may be afraid to admit that something's wrong, who may not see themselves in literature and may not see themselves in commercials or hear their journey talking about um, cultural differences, that they can see themselves in our story. And that if by sharing my story means that others who look like me share their story, that we could get resources and education out there to them, then it makes all the difference to me. That's where I'm, why I'm here today. Uh, Leo, it's Mario. Mm -hmm. I just Hi, Mario. Hi, I just may, I want to make a very quick comment on mm -hmm. what, Leah, uh, what Natasha has mentioned. And it sort of sticks in my mind about 
something when she said her family was in denial. I think this is very important because it's not only the family that is in denial. Uh, most often, it's also the person that's diagnosed oh, that is in denial. And this is very important because it is the fear about the illness that makes people uh, react to the illness. And it's very uh, stigmatizing, if I can say that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that my father shared, um, as Leah mentioned, my father and I shared our experience on the young onset um, dementia section on our, on our website now. Um, and one of the things that my father shared was that where he grew up, um, back in the day, way back, if you were to admit that you had Alzheimer's or dementia or if something was wrong, you were just put in one place. And unfortunately, that was sort of what back in the day you would call an insane asylum back then, you know, um, it would be this one sort of horrible, awful place that the crazy people went to. And, and in coming to Canada, um, sometimes a long-term care can seem like that or feel like that to people. And if they admit that something's wrong, the fear is that's the next step. Mm -hmm. And that is that is where I think the stigma and where the education is so important is that by just admitting that, that is not the next step. By early detection, by early admission of it, by looking at your symptoms and finding out how you could live well with dementia, it is a that is a real real journey and some people miss that and because they are so afraid to admit it they live with it until the very end stages and that's where the trouble can come in so you know this discussion is so important this discussion is something that i really um look forward to because talking about early detection and signs and symptoms can go a long way to um living really well with dementia that's a great point. Um, thanks both. Yeah. And bef before we, we, I, I want to keep talking. I also just want to uh, bring Cameron in a bit to this conversation. Um, there's one thing that, that, that uh, I know Mario, you've had, uh, you've written articles with the assistance of your niece and some younger relatives before. And Natasha, like you said, you were very young when your grandfather experienced dementia and also when you wanted the family to talk more about it. So I want to bring Cameron in. Cameron, you've done all this research on young caregivers and have some personal connections too. Um, can you speak a bit about why it's important to also think about the whole family and these younger caregivers and, and destigmatize this all for them too? Yeah, definitely. So um, from my personal experience, I got interested in young onset dementia because I um, was a caregiver at a young age from my own dad. And he didn't have dementia, but he had an acquired brain injury, or he has. And um, he had a very um, similar experience with, you know, his memory issues. And then our whole family kind of just was thrown into this little world. So it kind of inspired me to get into the research world of it when I was in school. And I was picking into what services are available for people like me. And there wasn't really a lot. So... Yeah, that's kind of where I went with my master's. Um, I talked to other adult child um, caregivers, for people with young onset dementia about their experiences and the variety of caregiving roles that they have, um, how diverse it can be. And also just looking at, you know, if they feel stigma, like what you're talking about, or if their parents feel stigma, that was a whole section of my uh, research and um, yeah, so that's kind of my experience. I think what's really interesting about it is that there's, it's not really talked about a lot, um, young onset dementia in general, but also just young, young caregivers. And many people don't even know that young caregivers exist. And sometimes when you're actually living in it, a young caregiver might not even identify as a young caregiver. Um, so I've always thought that that's really fascinating. And then it's kind of rippled into what's available and what services are or aren't available. So I really think that um, something that's needed is, you know, how does someone or a whole family, how do they navigate through the entire situation? What are some practical tips? What is something that they can use for um, financial help or how to find programs and services or how to just kind of cope through everyday life? And I don't think that, I think we're getting better, um, but I don't think that we're entirely there yet with 
with the services that can be provided. Yeah, um, on that note, uh, I know that throughout the dementia need in Canada, I know the dementia need in Canada overall is great, both for young dementia and old dementia. And there's a lot of service and program needs in the community and healthcare needs um, overall. Um, I just wanted to ask from each of your perspectives, feel free to jump in, whoever most wants to first, uh, given your research and experience, what do you feel um, more Canadians need to understand or do about young onset dementia um, in the coming, you know, like 2022? What's the most urgent from your perspective? I can jump in if you like. Great. Yes, please, Mario. Thank you. Yes, uh, 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 from my the, from the literature that I that I have read so far, uh, there are uh, like the, um, the I understand there's about half a million Canadians with with dementia, and three percent of that have uh, have a young uh, onset dementia, and when I look at the statistics in Australia, it's three percent, and in the in the United States, I believe it's nine percent. So even if this percentage looks small. If you look at the total number, there's still a considerable number of, of, of uh, people that are diagnosed in the, uh, in the, before they, uh, the age of 65. So uh, as for myself, after I was diagnosed, uh, I joined several uh, support groups, but I did not feel like I, I fit in. And it's like staring at my future and it did not look good. So. I had to quit attending, and and I I like to believe that this young onset dementia hub can create uh, awareness about this particular segment of people that have the diagnosis of dementia. I think it's a good idea to have uh, to initiate certain programs that are age appropriate that is uh, not sort of segregating people in their later stage but rather include some uh, age appropriate information for this group that i believe uh, might have been overlooked i don't know if that's the word thank you yeah that's going on top of that i think with younger caregivers um there's a definitely a lack of specific support groups that are for adult child caregivers across Canada. So I think that that would be something that I've been told is useful from other young caregivers, um, but also having the ability to meet with people informally um, for people who are younger is important too. So being able to connect with others in similar situations, I think that that would be a good priority to have, whether that's through maybe it's like a hiking group or something like a coffee shop. I think that um, looking at, you know, different forms of support groups is important for a younger population. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, um, I think that one of the ways I could see um, is is tech, I think, is one of the one thing that comes to mind for me. Um, and also sort of the definition of what a caregiver is. Sometimes we get lost in the fact that caregiver is the one who lives with, with the person. So for instance, um, my family, again, we talk about that multi-generational caregiving, um, what that looks like. Uh, my grandfather had four children. They were all super involved in his care and, but they would never consider themselves a caregiver. Right, because it was always my grandmother was their caregiver. Well, it, they were all very, very involved in that. And if they could consider themselves a caregiver, they may have reached out for some other help if they felt like it was a direct impact on their their own um, family life, which it was. We were all brought into it. You know, we all had to like pick up grandma, but also pick up from school, but also take to a doctor's appointment, but also go to soccer practice. It was all ingrained in all of our lives. So if we all felt like we were part of the circle of care, it might change what a caregiver looks like. And then the younger generation who is involved in that care may feel impacted more by it. Great point. Yeah. So, so far I'm hearing like more specific age appropriate or also cognitively appropriate, like a uh, program for people um, with, with young onset dementia for young caregivers and for a setup where um, the word caregiver doesn't always, isn't always intentionally self-applied. So yes, uh, Dr. Masili, I know you're more in the biomedical 
research space, but can you tell us what's most urgent in terms of your perspective for yeah. this year? Yeah, I think for young onset dementia, I, I think it's been mentioned already, but you know, kind of breaking down the barriers of stigma and increasing awareness is, is key. Um, so education is really important. Uh, now I'll put my kind of medical hat, scientific, scientific hat on. Research is key as well. Uh, in order to be able to you know, tackle the challenges of not only young onset dementia, but also late onset dementia, uh, trying to understand more about you know, what causes it. Um, so being able to identify individuals who may, for example, harbor a genetic mutation that's causing young onset Alzheimer's disease or, or young onset frontotemporal dementia, um, and being able to, to, to evaluate them using different kinds of tools we have, like brain imaging, like uh, cognitive tests, like biomarkers, which are measures that we can acquire from someone's blood, for example, or their spinal fluid, uh, that indicate you know, if someone has a mutation that causes young onset dementia. And by the way, it's much more common to see genetic causes, you know, if you're under the age of 60 or 65, uh, than if you're in your 80s. Um, and so being able to evaluate individuals who are at risk based on identification that they have a particular mutation, and then tracking the natural history of their disease through the completely asymptomatic phase to the prodromal phase, to the, you know, if it's Alzheimer's, the MCI phase, and then when they convert into dementia and identifying markers or tools that will help us understand that, that trajectory over time. Those, it's the same for the most part, not 100%, you know, this is not 100%, um, you know, uh, the, the way always, but for the most part, the same pathologies that cause young onset dementia are the same ones that cause late onset dementia. So the most common form of dementia under the age of 65 is still Alzheimer's disease and frontal temporal dementia is in close runnings with that. Uh, so if we can you know, understand the natural history of this disease during the prodromal presymptomatic phase and identify markers of converting, well, that maybe can be applied to older individuals who may not have a mutation, but the markers may still show the same because you know if they have Alzheimer's disease when they're older, it, it this pathology is is similar to the young onset pathologies. So so this is where I think uh, it, from a research standpoint, a scientific research standpoint, um, you know we and then identifying these individuals to uh, develop new molecules, new drugs that can target um, people before they develop symptoms because. The current thinking in, 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 in the research world is that once you have full-blown dementia, even if you had a drug that can remove the pathology, the damage to the brain has been done and, and is likely to be irreversible. So the idea is, can we prevent the onset of dementia by studying people before they develop symptoms? So that's kind of the reason, you know, some of the studies I'm involved in. Right. So would you like to see more individuals get genetic testing? Um, is that like a, how, how would that trickle down? So I, so I think that, I mean, I think that it, it depends on the indication. So if there's a very strong family history, so if we see multiple people in the same family having a similar form of dementia in and around the same age range, then uh, obviously we need to do genetic testing and that should be in someone who's in their 80s as well as someone who's younger. However, in young onset dementia, um, genetic causes are indeed more prevalent. So, so I have a much lower threshold for ordering and, and, and uh, genetic testing in someone who is a young onset form of dementia, um, especially for example, frontal temporal dementia, where about 20% of cases we can, we, we know genes that can cause that, uh, which is much more common than Alzheimer's disease where, you know, the common genes and also the, the most common mutations that cause Alzheimer's disease are less than 1%. Um, and I'm not talking about the APOE gene, which is a, which is a risk factor, not a, a causal mutation. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So, so I, I think that it is really, really uh, important that, um, first of all, in young onset dementia, that we consider treatable or reversible causes. So for example, sleep apnea can produce significant cognitive impairment, and that can be diagnosed with a sleep study. Um, and, and if you get treated with you know, this, the, the equipment called CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, to help with that, uh, that can help treat your symptoms and reverse the cognitive impairment. Uh, I think uh, I'd just like to comment on, on, on Mariel's journey um, you know, which is remarkable that, you know, he's, he's provided such a, such a, you know, uh, one, you know, such a, such a picture of his life and what he's gone through. I think that, you know, with certain types of dementia, especially if it's related to cardiovascular risk factors, making lifestyle changes and, and making sure you're on medications for cardiovascular risk factors in the case of what we call vascular cognitive impairment can be key. And if someone had a stroke that caused their dementia, if you prevent other strokes from happening, then you may also halt the disease progression as Mario alluded to. So depending on the cause of dementia, um, there may be you know, more or less things that we can do. Um, and so uh, the research needs to continue to happen and, and uh, to address this. I did, I, uh, it's Mario. I just want to make a quick comment on what uh, Dr. Masella said about CPAP machines. Uh, in, my, in the early stage of my di bad diagnosis, a few years after I was diagnosed, uh, my, my uh, geriatrician recommended using a CPAP machine, and I have been consistently using it for, for many years, uh, although lately I occasionally forget to put it on, but it, it gives me really a full night's sleep uh, whenever I put on that machine. Thank you. Yeah, so um, it's really important to acknowledge that there are these, these symptoms that uh, are caused by, by syndromes that are reversible, like you said, Dr. Maselli. So it's another reason to seek early diagnosis for dementia and also keep up um, like healthy physical uh, health habits, like Mario mentioned, sleep and, and eating well. Um, any thoughts then, I mean, uh, on Mario or Natasha or Cameron, um, um, Dr. Masselli has mentioned what he'd like to see in the research space in particular. Um, Maria, I know that when we were kind of conversing prior to this panel, you had some thoughts about how research should be directed in Canada in future, um, like uh, aside, maybe more on to treatments or care, care situations. I think it's important to do research uh, on uh, biomedical research because it improves uh, the, the way we can prevent dementia. And it, at the same time, I think uh, we need a little bit more attention on prevention, on things that, that can help improve the daily living of people with dementia. And uh, since the 1980s, uh, all to the present, it's really very perplexing to me that 99.9% .9 of, of research on drugs have failed. And so far, there's only one uh, that was approved by FDA. And even that drug is, uh, uh, is a little bit controversial uh, when it was approved by the American FDA, but I do believe that research is very important because uh, it is one way of helping uh, uh, thousands of people and the, uh, the, the incoming number of people as more and more of these uh, boom, uh, boomers, baby boomers uh, uh, reach their age, uh, like uh, most of them have reached the age of 75 already. So it'll be more and more of them that we need to, to address the situation uh, due to financial reasons and also for the emotional uh, issues and, and challenges to the person themselves, and in particular, the, the families that are affected by dementia. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Natasha, I was thinking of you because you help, um, you help also uh, locate people with dementia in the council who can help with evaluating research proposals every year for the Alzheimer's Society Research Program. Um, is there anything in particular you'd like to see researched as well, given like your, your great understanding of, 
of the narratives or experiences that are often excluded from, from research? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, within our advisory group um, and those we work with closely um, right now, I would just love to hear some different perspectives from different um, voices, different communities, um, different ethnicities, that sort of thing. Um, again, it, it's sort of the same story being told or sort of, and I don't mean to diminish anyone's story by saying that, but to hear from some different um, voices could change um, just the, the conversation a little bit around um, how people are navigating through this space. Yes, there is um, actually, Cameron's been trying to track some of the emerging research around um, uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, any research she can find on incidents of young dementia in black and indigenous uh, focused research. So can you give us some thoughts before we head to Q&A, Cameron, about, um, about uh, some findings that have jumped out there to you in reviewing all that recent research? Sure, I think. Mostly the thing that jumped out to me was that there's uh, pretty much a lack of it, um, especially in Canada. There's not really a lot of work that's been done on diverse populations within Canada and young onset dementia. Um, and that also extends to young caregivers, um, like just young, younger caregivers for people with young onset dementia in general, not great in Canada, but also in diverse populations. It, uh, there's a lot of work that can be done. and. Um, so I think that that's a really good angle or future direction that research can go into. And I think that that'll both for young onset dementia and the caregiver populations, um, it would be really beneficial to learn more about what the needs are um, based on that. And also looking at maybe even type of dementia um, and the specific type, not just lumping everyone into one category because caregiving roles can be extremely different based off of the type of dementia that someone has. So I think just kind of creating a better sense of what um, dementia, young onset dementia looks like in Canada um, and what those caregiving roles look like in Canada, both for people who are older and for people that are younger um, would be really helpful. So yes. I'm sorry, I don't have too much <laughs> actual information that I can share because there's, there's not a lot. <laughs> yeah, thanks for pointing that out. and. Um... I'll just say too, before we had to, to Q&A is that um, in a couple of minutes, that as somebody who, uh, you know, my mother got um, developed dementia at the age of 48, uh, frontotemporal dementia. And it was, it's a kind of dementia, that particular kind of frontotemporal dementia, she had a very short um, and very quick progress. So both uh, she and her aunt and my aunts who later developed it in their fifties and sixties, uh, the trajectory was like three years, three or four years. Um, from early stage to end stage. And so I'm just trying to say that even for me, as somebody who works with the Alzheimer's Society, I want to share with our audience that uh, in the past year, nine months that I've worked here, I've learned a lot about uh, what you were mentioning, Cameron, that diversity that exists even within different, like the 50 different diseases or more conditions that can lead to dementia. So vascular dementia, um, and which Mario was experienced in MCI, and it's a real vast field uh, for sure. Um, I also just want to acknowledge quickly that We've called this panel Growing the Conversation because we wanted to contribute um, to the conversation around young onset in Canada. But I also just want to acknowledge, of course, the, the amazing work that um, has already been happening in this space or is, is ongoing. So um, if you want to know more about people's lived experience, there's lots of ways. One is to read um, books by uh, Mary Beth Whiten, uh, Dignity uh, and Dementia Carpe Diem that came out uh, last year. Likewise, a book by Chrissy Felker, who lives in BC, called For This Ungrateful. Um, dementia Dialogues is doing a podcast about uh, young onset dementia that they're ramping up this year. Uh, and of course, Dementia Advocacy Canada has been doing great work uh, around advocating for folks with all kinds of dementia, as well as our own advisory group. Thanks, Mario and team, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's 1251. Um, I'm told we do have a Q&A time now um, from our tech team. So um, there is a question. Let's see here. Um, so somebody's asking, if I think that a relative has young onset dementia, how do I go about communicating that concern with them? It's very sensitive to bring up and I don't want them to feel aggrieved or embarrassed. 
thoughts, advice? I know it's a tough question, but it's an I, important one. I, I, I think that um, the first thing is um, that, you know, once again, you have to kind of break that the barrier of stigma. And a lot of times, you know, people don't want to talk about it or do, do something about it because of the stigma, as Natasha kind of had you know, mentioned, you know, with her own, you know, personal situation in her family. Um, so I think that, um, you, you know, it's always important to approach the person with dementia, but make sure that, you know, hopefully there's, there's someone else that can also be approached at the same time. You know, someone who would, you know, uh, you know, a spouse, uh, a, a child, for example, uh, someone who who can you know be you, that you can raise this issue with because if you're noticing it, chances are so are other people. One of the challenges with some types of dementia, uh, and not all types, but most types, uh, especially Alzheimer's disease and frontal temporal dementia, is that there can be a, a complete lack of insight or awareness and a denial of illness, which also you know came up. Mario mentioned de uh, denial, and so did Natasha. Um, and so if you're not bringing on board, you know, family members or, or, or friends or, or people who are close to this individual you're concerned about, um, then it may be much more challenging to approach that person because they may not even be aware and they may be in denial and they may get upset if you raise it with them. So I think bringing on a team uh, and, 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 and engaging others is, is key uh, as, as the start to it. Um, and then also providing some education as well. Yeah, I was going to couple that with some education as well, Dr. Mario. I was going to say that at times, um, it's it's great that you know you you have that suspicion, um, but it's also great to arm yourself with some knowledge first as well, um, coming to them um, with some suspicions without sort of something to back it. This might sound harsh, but something to back it and say, hey, I've read a couple of these articles and these are the things that I'm noticing. Um, does this resonate with you? Are these some of the troubles that you may be having? Or again, speaking to somebody who's within that circle of care, are you noticing these symptoms? And sort of having something um, like from our website that would say, these are the top 10 signs and symptoms. Um, I found this article. I feel like when, um, as Dr. Mario alluded to with our family, we didn't have that. We didn't have something that said, this is what we think grandpa is experiencing. It looks like this and able to take that to the doctor and say, these are the things he's looking at. We just were like, well, he's writing his name a bunch of times. And is that dementia? Is that not? Um, perhaps doing your own research first to make sure, um, calling someone who is well-versed in it and having a discussion about some of those things first before going to them. I, I want to thank the person who asked the question because this is a very important question in the sense that it involves the person and it in also involves the community, the friends and families. I like the idea of Dr. Mathelis when he said uh, that consult the, 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 the loved ones, the spouse, the family and friends, uh, because uh, let's keep in, uh, we need to keep in mind the, the autonomy of the person that, is, uh, that, that you suspect has dementia, because for all you know, he already suspects that something is wrong. And because of some of the issues, uh, 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 we mentioned about the stigma, he may be very hesitant uh, to, to talk about it or because uh, probably once it's disclosed, his financial situation, like especially those young onset people, they may still be working and it could affect their, their ability to earn income for the family. So they don't want it to known or they don't even want to, to start the diagnosis, but it is very important that for him to, to be able to seek help or be able to, to be diagnosed so that, uh, as I uh, mentioned previously, some of them can be preventable. Some of these uh, issues can be preventable. And it's always nice to know what is going on. So basically, I think we need to respect the rights of that person. So we just don't barge in and, and tell him, go see a doctor or whatever. I think uh, we need to be uh, sort of cognizant of uh, 
of, of the situation. And I really like what Dr. Masala said that consult loved ones be, uh, rather than talk to that person first. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Um, we also do have a question that um, Cameron has, was for Cameron as she's kind of typed an answer to, but Cameron, I'm wondering if you can review this. I'll just read the question and then maybe you can share your thoughts because others here might have thoughts as well. Um, Tyler asked, hi, I have a question for Cameron. You mentioned one of the challenges for these young caregivers is that they often don't know what a caregiver quote unquote is. I think some other people spoke to that as well. And they don't self-identify as a caregiver quote unquote. In your opinion, what can be done to help support and educate young carers, especially those who are still in elementary school or high school? Thank you. So Cameron, do you wanna to speak to that and then we'll open it up. Sure, yeah, I just wrote a little answer there. Uh, so thanks for the question. Yeah, I, I found that um, building yourself a support network can be really useful, especially when you're still in school. And that can be through talking to your teachers um, if you feel comfortable with that about your situation. Um, also talk, finding other people in similar situations to talk um, is another good way to both educate yourself on what you can do for your situation uh, and also to educate others on, on different situations. So maybe if you can you know, contact your local society, if you, um, if they have a support group and if they don't have a support group, just even asking for one is a good way to start to advocate for yourself. And um, that's kind of the point we're at, I think right now is that you, you have to start to talk about your experience and hopefully if we all talk about it enough, then more services and supports will be made. So, and I think I also wrote in there to have open and honest conversations with your family and friends. If it's, um, if that's an option for you, um, that's a really good way to find some extra support for yourself. Yeah. Thanks, Cameron. I actually see we're kind of at the wrap up time. I'll also just mention to Tyler, there's a site called youngcaregivers.ca that has resources for, um, for educators and uh, kids and um, also kids help phone. Just can't cut a shout them out because- uh, Yeah, there's some good online yeah. forums um, yeah. that people can ask questions to as well. I think that's yeah. how Young Cares Connect. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we also have some resources on our website, but um, mm -hmm. thank you for, I guess we've kind of started the conversation and hopefully we'll grow it further uh, here and elsewhere um, because it is 12.59 here in Toronto. And uh, it's time for me to thank our wonderful panelists uh, for their attendance, to our guests, to our audience for attendance and for your questions. Um, please know that the recording of the panel itself will be posted to our website in the next couple of days. Um, so please follow us on social media. Our handles are in the chat box to get alerted for when the recording is available and also to get news about our next kind of conversation, Dementia Talks Canada Combo. Um, a survey will be going out to all of you in the audience. So um, please do fill that out. And um, again, just a big thank you to all of you for participation. Uh, and feel free to reach out to your local Alzheimer Society or us here at ASC if uh, you have any questions. Um, we're also at alzheimer.ca slash young onset. And any feedback can go to research at alzheimer.ca. Thanks so much and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.